Hello, and welcome to Word on the Reef, a podcast where we take the plunge into one of the world's most spectacular natural wonders, the Great Barrier Reef. Today, we're heading to stunning Lizard Island, part of a group of islands on the northern remote section of the reef. To get there, we're going to take a one-hour scenic flight north from Cairns. As we come into land, look out your window and you'll see a group of rocky mountains fringed by pure white sandy beaches, a turquoise lagoon and coral reefs. The island is home to a luxurious resort and a scientific research station run by the Australian Museum. As we touch down, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the island we're visiting today, the Dingal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. To them, the island is known as Jigaru, and their occupation here goes back tens of thousands of years to the last ice age, when sea levels were lower and the islands were connected to the mainland by grassy plains. Lizard Island is a beautiful place to dive and snorkel. But right now, the marine ecosystem on this island is experiencing extreme stress. Carbon pollution from the mining and burning of fossil fuels like coal, oil and gas across the globe is heating up our planet and our oceans, causing more frequent and severe marine heat waves. And sea surface temperatures on the Great Barrier Reef are up to 2.5 degrees Celsius above average. Corals are extremely heat sensitive and the heat is taking its toll causing corals to turn pale and white in a phenomenon known as coral bleaching. On the 8th of March, the Marine Park Authority confirmed the Great Barrier Reef is experiencing a mass coral bleaching event, the fifth one in eight years. Now, back in episode two, we discussed how corals get their bright colours, what coral bleaching is, what it means, how different corals are affected differently by coral bleaching what corals can do to survive and regenerate from coral bleaching, and what we can do to help protect them. All that background is going to be super helpful for understanding what's happening to the reef in today's episode. So if you haven't already, I highly recommend you go back and listen to that episode first. After stepping off our small charter plane at the Lizard Island runway, we are taken to the research station, where we can relax looking out over the white sandy beach and the turquoise water gently lapping at the edge of the lagoon. Here we are met by Dr Anne Hoggett. She and her husband Lyle have been the directors of the Lizard Island Research Station for more than 30 years. Hello Anne, how are you? Hello Tanya. Thanks for having us here on Lizard Island. That's a pleasure. Can you please tell us a bit about yourself? Who are you and what do you do? I trained as a marine scientist and I've worked as a taxonomist before I moved to Lizard Island in 1990. I've been in my current job for 34 years this year, which is a very long time, but um, it's at Lizard Island Research Station, which is um, at Lizard Island in the northern part of the Great Barrier Reef. It's run by the Australian Museum as a facility for scientists from all over the world to come and study whatever it is they want to study on the Great Barrier Reef. I think you're living my absolute dream life, living on a tropical island for more than 30 years. Must have been absolutely amazing. Most people can only dream of that. What's it like? Oh, it's incredible. My husband is the other director here and we came here with our young son when he was four. And uh, we originally thought that we'd only be here for five years. And uh, here we are nearly 35 years later. Uh, It's a very hard place to leave. I can imagine. (laughs) That's Yeah. Their life is incredibly interesting. We have um, a large number of people visit us from Australia and overseas. It's a very busy place and the people are so interesting and it's it's not the least bit isolated here, even though it might seem like it, Um, but it's it's a very cosmopolitan place and people have a very like-mindedness about things. You know, they're all interested in um, coral reef ecology and um, they're all happy to be here. So it's a really happy little community here. Yeah, you must have seen some incredible things over the years, probably too many stories to tell, but what would you say is a memory that stands out the most for you of of one of the most incredible experiences you've had with a marine wildlife or something like that? Oh, there's so so many of those. You're right. There's there's millions of them. But I I suppose one is in the early days that we were here when we saw um, a port of what we thought were dolphins in the distance out at the outer barrier, and we went closer to see what they were, and they actually turned out to be false killer whales. They, they leap around like dolphins, but they haven't got a little bottle nose. They've got a sort of rounded head. 
And we just stopped the boat and they came up to us in, on the shallow reef flat. And they stayed, we, we actually left them. They stayed with us for hours. It was quite amazing. That would have been amazing. Unfortunately, at the moment, though, the 8th of March, the Marine Park Authority confirmed that the reef is currently experiencing its fifth mass coral bleaching event in eight years. What are you seeing at Lizard Island? It's pretty bad here. Like in 2016, which was the really big one, um, it looks like Lizard Island is ground zero in this neck of the woods. Um, in 2016, we lost a really large proportion of the corals here. They just died from uh, the temperature being too high. They bleached. They lost their source of nutrition. They were very sick and almost all of them died. In the eight years since then, um, in some parts around Lizard Island, the corals have regenerated incredibly well all by themselves without any interventions whatsoever. And so it's absolutely devastating to see them all bleaching again. Um, even though this is the fifth coral bleaching, the mass coral bleaching that's been declared recently, at Lizard Island we've had more than that. We have had corals bleach here in each of the last five years. So we've had five bleachings in five years. Oh, my goodness. That would make it, that would make it eight since 2016. So basically so, annual. It's every year now. Yeah, yeah. And annual back-to-back -back coral bleaching events was predicted some time ago to start happening about mid-century. And here we are in you know the early 2020s and it's happening already. So um, there's nothing wrong with the predictions that were made back then, except they gave us more time than we really had. It's been really shocking. But this, this bleaching event that we're seeing now is by far the worst one that we have seen since that dreadful one in 2016. And that really puts us in uncharted territory because you know, nobody's ever seen these sorts of bleaching events on a wide scale. You know, we've only seen them in, in recent years, I mean. Um, and so now we're seeing corals that are really badly bleached, but we don't know if they can recover. The only time we've seen corals bleach on a big scale like this at the stage that the corals are at now today was back in 2016, and then they all died. We don't know now whether if the weather changes in time and the temperature starts to cool down a bit, whether they still have the capacity to recover again or if they've already gone too far. So it's, it's really scary times. We know that climate change is making the atmosphere hotter and that enables it to hold more moisture, which can lead to more extreme rainfall and weather events. And although cyclones are a natural occurrence in the tropics, when you factor in the warming climate and coral bleaching, how are all these combined impacts affecting the reef? So at Lizard Island, we had four years in a row of just hideous disasters here. Two Category 4 cyclones, 11 months apart. That was Cyclone Ita in 2014, and then Cyclone Nathan in 2015, mm. and then the massive coral bleaching in 2016, and then the conditions were in 2017 just as bad as 2016. Mm. So those four years decimated the population, absolutely literally. There was less than 10% of the corals left. So, um, you know, it, the, the recovery since then has been quite extraordinary, but it's important to note that it's not everywhere. It's concentrated around the outside of the island group. The lagoon has barely begun to recover at all, so the lagoon still looks pretty sad. That must have been quite devastating to have two cyclones and then two mass coral bleaching events back to back. After diving and snorkeling on that reef and that island for more than 30 years and with this bleaching happening now, how does it feel to see this happening? Oh, I mean, it's incredibly sad, but it also makes me really angry because we're not doing enough to stop this from happening again and again. You know, we, we, we need to do better than we're doing. I think the science community is, is doing a good job. You know, we're, we're learning from it. It's a massive experiment happening on a scale that you'd never get permission to do if you wanted to do the experiment. Mm. And so, you know, it's happening. And so we're learning as much as we can from it while it is happening. And we're learning an awful lot. But, um, you know, we need to stop it from happening. You know, the, the Earth's climate changes, you know, it's, it's always changed and it always will change. The difference with this one is that we're doing it mm. and it is within our capacity to stop it from happening. And we are not doing that seriously and quickly enough. Mm. If you could send a message to the world, particularly to our leaders, for example, what message would you like to send them about what needs to be done? Oh, we need to stop creating carbon emissions. I mean, it's all very well to be spending 
heaps of money on various things to help the Great Barrier Reef. Um, you know, I believe that we've, the government's put an extra $1.2 billion into it. That's great, wonderful, but it's not enough. What needs to be done is to stop approving new coal mines and things like that. We don't have the time to, to say, oh, well, you know, we've got a target for 2030 or another target for 2050. That, that's too far away. It's going to be too late if, if we don't start acting more quickly, more seriously, really quickly. Yeah, and of course, there's more than 64,000 people who depend on the Great Barrier Reef for employment, and it brings in $6 billion to our economy every year. So both from an economic perspective and an environmental perspective, uh, we can't afford not to act quickly on this. No, we, we don't have time to delay that. That's true. But I think in Australia, the mining industry, perhaps it has a louder voice. I don't know. But there, there seems to be the, um, the need to prop up the mining industry at the expense of the tourism industry when you look at the scale of those two things. And, and that's, that's, that's what we can't continue to do. You know, we have to prioritise the environment because, as you say, if, if we don't have an environment to live in, we haven't got anything. And, and we're moving that way. I, I truly believe we are. You know, coral reefs are really at the forefront of the changes that are going to be upon us all. I mean, they already are upon us all with the fires and the floods and everything. It's, it's sort of incontrovertible now that this, this is actually happening. You know, it, the speed needs to be quicker and, and the cuts need to be made more deeply into the carbon emissions that, that we're putting out. Absolutely. You mentioned that you raised a son on the island. Do you have grandkids and, and do you... What do you see happening in the future? Do you hope that they'll be able to go and be on Lizard Island and that there'll be an amazing reef there for them in the future? I don't have any grandchildren. I would hope that if I did have some that they would be able to do that. But to be quite honest, I don't think they will. I, I think that we're moving too slowly. You know, the, the reef is incredibly resilient. You know, I've been blown away at how quickly the corals have come back in some of the places around Lizard Island. But you think about what has allowed that to happen. That's because the corals in other parts, you know, when these things happen, even though you call it a mass coral bleaching event, it's not everywhere. You know, like we missed out on the 1998 bleaching. Lizard Island was unaffected by that. And so because we're part of a really big system, there are other places that have corals intact that can now, you know, provide the spawn to the corals back to places like Lizard Island. And that's fantastic. But as this goes on and on and more places are affected in a patchwork over you know years and decades, that resilience must slow down. You know, it, it's, well, there's it's a, just, there's a it limit. just can't keep going. Yes, there is a limit. You know, different species will become more um, abundant than other species. I mean, that's the sort of thing that we're studying here all the time. There's definitely going to be winners and losers. But the thing is that the corals are the architects of the reef. They provide the structure, the habitat, the spaces for the enormous biodiversity that exists on coral reefs. And without the corals, that massive diversity, which is part of the reef's value and excitement and beauty, it, it's just not going to be there. So it'll be a different kind of ecosystem. And, you know, it's not going to be as pretty to human beings as this one. It's not going to support the life that this one supports. So I think we really need to do everything we can to, to stop it from happening. Absolutely. So for any listeners who might want to do something to help, even if they don't get to visit the reef all the time like you and I do. What are some things people can do to help? Well, I think people can help by doing lots of little things, you know, become a vegetarian, use a bike or walk rather than drive your car, all those little things that most people know about, change your light bulbs. They're not going to be enough. You know, it's, it's yeah. helpful. It's a good thing to do. But in the scheme of things, it's, it's truly not enough. Mm. Really, we need government to stop supporting carbon emissions by approving new coal mines and things like that. We need bigger and quicker efforts to go into renewable energy and, you know, not to worry about targets, you know, decades down the track. Just do it as quickly as we possibly can. <laughs> and it's got to be quicker than those targets that they have. It's, we don't have time. Yeah. We'll lose roots if we stick to those targets. What people can do Really, the best thing they can do is to talk about the issue mm. and to talk about it um, among their friends, to raise awareness among the population, you know, talk about your kids, to your parents, to your friends, your schools, but really to talk about it with your politicians. Mm -hmm. um, you know, really get involved, you know, become part of the movement and make sure the politicians know that we really care about what is 
It is within our power to change it. We've got the tiniest little a gap in the window now, which is rapidly closing. And it, this has got to come from government. So we need to be making a big noise. Yeah, absolutely. We do need policy changes at the moment. There are new fossil fuel projects awaiting approval in Australia. And, you know, our oh. governments can choose to give them the green light and also to continue giving them things like, you know, financial support and tax cuts. Or they could choose to transition to, you know, a renewable energy economy, which will create tens of thousands of jobs in renewable energy. So, you know, the government does have choices there. And that doesn't mean that people have no control over it. We can use our votes, our voices, we can talk to our politicians, we can sign petitions. And no matter where people are in the world, even if there's someone listening to this who's on the opposite side of the world to the Great Barrier Reef, everywhere you can find a climate action group near you that you can join and they'll give you resources and training and support to be able to to do those things if you've never done them before, like writing to your local politician and things like that. They're actually quite easy. Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. And it's, it, you know, it's good. And they do listen to you. They may not you know, do exactly what you want them to do, but the more that they hear from people, the people who are, you know, they hope will vote for them, the, the more that they will be on side. So what do scientists at the research station do during bleaching events like this? Does the bleaching at least provide an opportunity for learning? Yeah, these, these sorts of bleaching events are very busy times here because there's a great interest in the media and also from the scientists who come here. So, you know, we just try to match those and give people access to the reefs as much as we, we possibly can. Mm. But in terms of what we, we do, the science here is it's a very diverse lot of projects that are done here and some people are studying a particular species and other people are studying systems and how species interact with each other and with the environment. And all of the projects that come here basically have a sting in the tail, which is, and what happens to this in climate change? And so, of course, when we have an event like this, we get a lot of scientists wanting to come back here. They may not have planned to be here at this time, but they want to be here while the corals are bleaching to study what's happening to whatever it is that they're studying normally. So it's a very, very busy time here uh, looking into all that. Is there any message of hope you can leave us on? What do you focus on to keep yourself going through devastating bleaching events like this? In terms of a a message of hope, I'm afraid I can't really give one unless we pull our finger out to be blunt and very quickly. These 2030 and 2050 targets aren't ambitious enough and they're not going to cut it for coral reefs. So if you want to come and see a coral reef, come and do it soon while it's still there. How important is it? to keep supporting the tourism industry because I know that people visiting places like Lizard Island really helps to raise awareness because people from all over the world can learn about the reef and maybe go home and take steps in their own life to help protect it. Do you agree with that? And yeah, how important is tourism? Oh, tourism is incredibly important and I think it's done very well on the Great Barrier Reef. It's not done so well in some other places where tourists can have a deleterious effect on the coral reefs because it's not managed properly. But I think that tourism is done very well on the Great Barrier Reef. And my experience here is that once somebody has come here and seen with their own eyes a coral reef in good shape, they're a convert forever. They're just so beautiful. It's a life-changing event for people. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I'll be heading out for diving tomorrow. And no matter how many times I go out for a dive or a snorkel on the reef, I never get tired of it. It is sad to see what's happening right now, but You talked about hope a minute ago and, you know, I think hope is, it's an action. If we all take action and are part of the solution, that's what creates hope. And I know there's, there's so many people out there doing amazing work, whether it's, you know, advocating to government and getting stronger climate policies in place, which is progressing. And, you know, if we keep doing that, then we will be able to keep progressing it and hopefully speeding it up. So we can't afford to give up. And also, it's not an all or nothing approach because, you know, it may be that we will lose some vulnerable species, um, may already be losing some vulnerable species. But every fraction of a degree of warming that we stop, every tonne of coal that we keep in the ground, could be one more species of coral that we save or one more flood event that we stop or one more island in the Torres Strait that we stop from being disappeared by rising sea levels. So there's still so much left to protect. We've got an amazing reef still right now and 
yeah, we've got to fight for it and there'll never be a point where we should just give up because there'll always be well, still things left to protect, right? You're, you're completely right about that. This is the shifting baselines thing. People who have not experienced the coral reef can come to Lizard Island and see what it looked like after all those disasters and they still went away with a fabulous experience because we still had turtles, we still had little fishes, we still had lots of coral trout. The coral trout were big, fat and happy because they were able to eat their prey who had nowhere to hide because mm. all the corals were you know, not fulfilling their mm. functional beauty. So people get a great experience in a very degraded reef system. And to me that's pretty sad. It's great for the tourism, but as people will still come, you know, we need to be careful of the shifting baselines too because, um, you know, what you see after those disasters, even though it is still appealing to people, you know, it's still a warm day, the water is clear, you like swimming in it and there are things to look at. It's, it's the, 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 the system sort of broken, you know, when the, the corals aren't there to provide the habitats for the fish and the invertebrates and stuff that they normally do. So we've got to watch out for those shifting baselines. Yeah, absolutely. There's still Lizard Island. Is I would highly recommend it to anyone. It's a beautiful tropical island with pure white sand and you can dive into turquoise water and be surrounded by turtles and fish. And that's still going to be there. Um, but like you said, the ecological impacts that are perhaps not well known to the ordinary person are still very much happening. And that's something that yeah. you can definitely notice as an expert. So. Um, yeah, thanks very much for your time today, Dr. Anne Hoggett. We'll all be keeping our fingers crossed for Lizard Island and any other areas of the reef that are being impacted right now and really hoping that those temperatures cool down. That's right. The next couple of weeks really will be critical to this. So, um, yeah, we've all got our fingers and toes crossed here that it's, uh, it's all going to survive again as it has over the last five years when we've had bleaching events. But uh this is worse than we've had in the last five years. So it's uncharted territory, as I said. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Thanks for talking to me. It's uh, been really good. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Anne Hoggett today. Saving the Great Barrier Reef can seem like a mammoth task when we are on our own. But when we raise our voices together, it makes a huge difference. Just last year, Australia's Federal Environment Minister, Tanya Plibersek, rejected a proposed Clive Palmer-owned coal mine in central Queensland after receiving thousands of letters, submissions and visits from concerned reef lovers like you. And just over a year ago, a Queensland court found that another proposed Clive Palmer-owned coal mine in the Galilee Basin should be rejected after a group of young people and traditional owners argued it would infringe on their rights by contributing to climate change. But these wins only happened due to people power, and no matter where you are in the world, you can help. We need to continue to use our votes, our voices, letters, petitions, conversations, communications and more to ask for stronger climate policies. And for many of us, that starts by joining a climate advocacy group. Whether you volunteer, donate or simply join the mailing list and occasionally sign petitions, by joining a climate advocacy group in your area, you can connect with other like-minded people and get the resources and information you need to make a difference. For example, Right now, there is something easy and very important you can do to help the reef. Visit www.fightforourreef.org.au and click on Take Action to sign a letter to the Queensland Opposition Leader and Shadow Environment Minister, asking them to support strong climate targets, which are being voted on in the Queensland Parliament on April 16th. The details are all explained on the website, so head there to learn more. It only takes a few seconds to enter your name and hit send, and your signed letter will be sent off automatically. That address again to sign that letter is www.fightforourreef.org.au. If thousands of people flood our leaders on all sides of government with letters asking for strong climate action to protect our reef, we can make a difference. But don't just take my word for it. In a future episode coming up soon, we'll be talking with a climate solutions expert to find out what is already being done to address climate change, what more we need to do, the costs and benefits of different types of renewable energy versus fossil fuels, whether it's okay to advocate for climate action while still owning a petrol car and taking occasional holidays on aeroplanes, how to separate the real solutions from distractions and greenwashing, and what we can all do to contribute. So to make sure you don't miss that episode and lots of other awesome and inspiring interviews coming up soon, 
please subscribe to this series and follow Word on the Reef on Instagram to find out when it's time for our next adventure. This is a not-for-profit passion project, so if you enjoyed it, please write a review, share, and tell your friends. If you'd like to sponsor this podcast, please consider becoming a patron for as little as $5 a month over at patreon.com slash word on the reef podcast. You'll get a shout out and the proceeds will help towards covering costs like podcast hosting, email hosting, website hosting, and so on. That's all for now. Best fishes and see you next time.